Chevy. I tell you, that's not a good sign. So, uh, uh, well, listen, uh, if you will, let's all stand. We're going to lead you through a fellowship song. Now, a couple of things I need to tell you. One is if you'll notice our offering boxes, uh, we have an offering box over here. We have one here, and we have one uh, back in the foyer. So, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to be doing the regular offering, passing the plate and all that. So uh, just find your way to those whenever you uh, want to drop off your tithes and offerings. Uh, but that's where they'll be located. Now, while we're leading you through a song, I'm hoping that you'll get around and do a little fellowshipping. Hug some necks, shake some hands. We've got a lot of guests with us today. It's good to have all of you with us today. So get around, introduce yourself, and let them know there'll be a test on all those names later. So uh, join in with us as we sing about that glorious day coming up soon. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you saved my soul and now your freedom is all that I know the old made new Jesus when I met you oh what a day you called my name My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the end. You. Mm -hmm. 
that, that line, I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. Have you ever needed a rescue before? Amen. Well, listen, say God uh, can save us. God can rescue us. God can protect us. And praise his name. Grant's going to lead us in a song. Oh, praise the name. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. I save your arm, that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, pray. I know those of us that know Jesus Christ as Savior, we understand those songs. We understand uh, about that glorious day that we're going to have and to praise him for what he's done for us. But there may be some that are watching online or maybe some even here that don't truly understand that. Well, you know, uh, Brother Johnny, you don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. So so that option is out for me. I don't have that option. No, you do. 
Matter of fact, that's the only option you've got. Um, the only way you're going to have that joy and peace and victory is through Jesus Christ. What he's done. It doesn't matter where you've been or how far you've gone or what rabbit hole you've been down. Um, Jesus paid the price for us. Not just he paid the price if you were good enough because we will never be good enough. He paid the price for all of us. Brother Jason's going to lead us in one of our one of my favorite songs, uh, probably many of you's, yours. It says, Jesus paid it all. He didn't pay for most of it. He didn't pay for some of it. He didn't pay if you'll be good enough. He paid it all. We just have to trust in him. You can accept Christ as Savior today. It's, 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 uh, it's a simple task, really. It's just realizing that we're lost and that we need a Savior and that Jesus Christ is the one that can pay that price and the only one. And then it's just committing your life to him and saying, Lord, I don't understand it all, but, but you said it. I believe it. Here I am. Just take me. So, Brother Jason, lead us in that place. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power and Thine alone Can change the leper's spots And melt the heart of stone Jesus paid it all white as snow and when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow sin and stain he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow he washed it white as snow oh praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life And he paid it all for you and for me. 
Because Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Amen. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you that you knew that there would be that separation from us, and there's nothing that we could do to fill that gap, that you knew it. But, Lord, you knew it from the beginning of time. You sent your Son to come and live a perfect, sinless life and die on the cross for our sins. Lord, I know how undeserving I am, but, Lord, you thought I was worth that. And, Lord, you would have done it if it would have only been for me. But, Lord, it was for all. You paid it all for all of us. Lord, I thank you that you died that cruel death that I deserved. And, Lord, that, that I will escape that now because of you. And thank you for that. That, Lord, when I breathe my last, Lord, that the next vision I see will be the face of Jesus. I thank you for that, Lord, that I won't go through that uh, that that place of hell and torment uh, that you've designed because I've accepted you. Lord, as this next song is saying, I allowed your wounds to pay my price. It's by your wounds that I've been healed. Lord, thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, by His wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, by His wounds we are healed. We are healed by Your sacrifice in the life that You gave. We are healed, for you paid the price. By your grace we are saved, we are saved. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was, he was crushed, crushed for, for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him. And by His wounds, by His wounds we are healed. healed by your sacrifice in the life that you gave we are healed for you paid the price by your grace we are saved we are saved for our transgressions he was crushed for our sins the punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds by his wounds we are healed 
And by his wounds, by his wounds, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Lord, thank you for that. Thank you that nothing can do it but your blood, Lord. Help us to realize that. Help us to live accordingly. Help us to make that decision to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Amen. As you're taking your seat, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask real quick if some of our teenagers would come give me a hand. Because today is Father's Day. And uh, as we do every year at Father's Day and Mother's Day, we as a church try to get uh, a small gift that we can give to uh, our fathers for that, uh, and uh, so if I can get a few teenagers to come give me a hand. Guys, y'all, and, and girls, sorry, y'all come on up. Uh, let's see, the number of teenagers that came to help, let's start out with everybody grabbing one. Um, I think we have almost a one-to-one -one ratio here. That's good. Usually you ask for help and, and you don't get much. Uh, if you are a father, would you stand so that our teenagers know exactly who to go to other than their own parents? Uh, and we make sure that every father in the room gets one of these special coffee mugs. And Teenagers, once you hand out the one you have, if there's still men standing, make sure you go get another one and bring it to them. And men, once you get yours, you can go ahead and have a seat. That way they know who we still have left to, to wait on. Uh, I think we've got three more, guys. All right. And men, I know this isn't a huge thing. It, it's not an awfully expensive thing, but it's something that I hope every time you look at it, every time you use it, you'll be reminded of how much your church family loves you and appreciates you for, for all that you do for your family uh, and for our church. And I hope that you have a, a wonderful, wonderful, blessed day today. Uh, now, we didn't put this out there because it was kind of a, a last minute uh, thing, but uh, are we still, okay, we are going to have a special time for the kids right now during the preaching time for any of the kids that are uh, fourth grade and under, or third grade and under, I think we said, uh, or fourth grade and under, I just say you She'll take them all, but Janae's going to take them. They're going to do a special craft and lesson for Father's Day today. And Sophia. And Sophia. All right. So we got some, some helpers going. Uh, but kids, if y'all want to follow them, y'all are going to go have some fun, and y'all don't have to listen to me. I'm glad they didn't cheer and, you know, cartwheels and, you know. Every now and then you'll have that one that goes, yes. And sometimes Brother Johnny and Keith will try to sneak out with them and, Tell them, no, you're too old now. Uh, not for everything, just for children's church. Yeah. Unless you're volunteering. If you're volunteering, you can go help lead. Okay, okay. That's kind of what I figured. <laughs> uh, if you would turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. Um, I'm going to be honest. I don't know that, that I've ever had as much trouble putting together a message for Father's Day as I did this year. Uh, I wrestled back and forth with several different things, and the one thing that stayed the same was the passage that I really felt drawn to, and uh, it's the reason why when, when we did the, the mugs, uh, it's the scripture that I used for the mugs. Uh, the, to me, it's, it's probably one of the, the most uh, essential scriptures that we have forefathers to understand, to, to see what Joshua did and, and the statement that Joshua made, the commitment that he made, and the challenge that he presented to others uh, it is so important for us as fathers to understand. But how to get the point across and, and what to emphasize in the commitment that he showed and the challenge that he made is where I kind of struggled. And uh, then I, I started kind of putting things together and the Lord started showing me a few things and then it just kind of shut down for a while, and, and I'd read, and I'd study, and I'd read, and I'd study, and I'd pray, and I'd read, and I'd study, and then all of a sudden, one day, it was almost like just, there it was, all of it, uh, and, and it was so encouraging to me to see how God opened it up, and, and he showed me these things and gave them to me, and it, it, it's been just an incredible journey for me. That
last few days uh, this week in, in working on this and seeing how God was preparing a specific message for a specific time, and I believe for specific people. So here's, here's what I'm going to say before we get into the message. If you're here today, don't think, and, and we go through this message, and you go, man, Brother Jason was picking on me. I didn't know you were going to be here, number one. Uh, I didn't know for sure what I was going to present when, when I got up here, number two. Number three, it's not my message in the first place. Uh, it's, it's God's message. It, it's his word for us. Uh, and, and the other thing, as I always say, whether it's graduation Sunday, Mother's Day, Father's Day, or some other emphasis, if you're not a father, that doesn't exclude you from the message today. The emphasis is to our fathers and to those that will one day become fathers. But the message, the challenge is the same for every person who claims to be a believer and follower of Christ. We all need to adhere to what, what Joshua challenged and what we're going to look at today. But before we get into even the passage, I, I want to tell you about a story that, that I came across. I know it's not Boudreaux Thibodeau, so uh, this one has a little more relevance to it. Um, but I found a story about a little boy who uh, one night got fearful because of a storm, the thunder, the lightning, and everything. He, he called out in the dark to his dad, told him he was scared, and the dad comes in through him and says, son, it's It's okay. It's okay. You're safe in the house. Not only that, but remember, we've always told you God loves you and he's going to take care of you. And the little boy looked at his dad and says, I know that God loves me, dad, but right now I want somebody who has skin on. And though that, that could be a humorous thing, you know, you think the mind of a child, I, yeah, I know that God loves me, but I need someone I can touch. I need someone I can see. But if you look into a little bit of what the boy said, what Kind of what he was saying is, I know that God loves me, but dad, I, I, need, I need God's love to come through you right now. I need you to be the physical presence of the power of God's love in my life in this moment. What he was saying is, I need God with skin on through you. And that is, is kind of what, what I want us to grasp today, because I believe we see that exemplified in Joshua probably more than any other biblical character in the Bible. Joshua was God with skin on. And it wasn't just because he made this one statement. We can go and read throughout all the story of Joshua, and Joshua was a faithful man of God from the first time we see him to the last time that we see him. Was he perfect? No, he wasn't. He, he, got, he got a little, a little careless, like, like we all do. He got a little comfortable and kind of took his foot off the gas and coasted for a little bit, and then AI took place. Right after Jericho, you know, he, he didn't make sure that everybody adhered to the rules God gave once they conquered Jericho. But when he recommitted, he took it serious. And he followed God. And Joshua was a great man of God. And, and as we get to the end of his life, as we get to the time where, by the time we get to chapter 24 in Joshua, all the land that God told them he was going to conquer, he's given to them. It's theirs. They've already started to divide it up among the different tribes of who's going to settle where, and, and that assignment has been made. And this is the last great assembly of the, the leaders of the tribes. And Joshua has called them all together, and he's not calling them together to go, all right, guys, here's the, here's the pep talk. He's calling them together because he's saying, listen, don't fall for the same trap that our fathers did. Don't give in to the temptations. And Joshua in that moment made a challenge to them. And, and though his challenge really, I don't think at its core, had anything to do about what kind of father to be, it was what kind of follower to be. What, what type of person in relationship to God who had given them all that they had, that they should be. But I think it's very clear that if we as fathers adhere to what Joshua said to the people as a whole, we will lead our families as godly fathers. So if you would, stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Joshua 24, we're going to start with verse 14. And Joshua, as he's in the midst of this speech, he's reviewed some of the history of, of their journey to this point. And when he gets to verse 14, he says, Therefore, with, with all that we know, with all that we've been through, therefore, fear the Lord and worship Him in sincerity and truth. Get rid of the gods your fathers worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship Yahweh, the Lord. But if it does not please you to worship Yahweh, choose for yourselves today the one you will worship. 
the gods your fathers worshipped beyond the Euphrates rivers, uh, the god of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my family, we will worship Yahweh. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I want to come before you right now and just want to thank you, God, for this time that we've had to, to be together, to worship you, to lift up your name. God, to, to sing of our, our gratitude for all that you have done. God, I thank you for the clear message of our, our songs of worship today. God, you called us from death into life. God, completely echoing what, what we studied in Sunday school this morning. God, this, the, the concept that we were once dead, but because of your love, your mercy, and your grace, you have made us alive through Christ Jesus. And now you've called us to live for you. And God, I thank you that in the story, the children of Israel and of Joshua in this moment, we see that very thing depicted. God, you had called them out of bondage in slavery in Egypt, have brought them into the land of promise, and now through Joshua, you're challenging them to live in obedience to you. Father, I pray that today as we look to your word, I pray that today as we seek a message from you, God, that we would hear you loud and clear. God, help us to get past the distractions of the things of this life in this moment, that the only thing we'd be focused on, the only voice we would listen to is yours. So that you could speak a clear message to our hearts, to our minds. And God, that you could make your will known for us. We love you. We praise you. And we ask this all in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. As we look at this, these two verses, I want us to see a few things that Joshua did, some things that he said, here's, in my opinion, if, if we were to take his, his speech that day, his challenge that day, and turn it into a, a uh, presentation for, for fathers and for us as believers today, I think there's three critical things that Joshua said, here's what you need to do, that, that we need to understand, we need to grasp, and we need to begin to apply to our life. And the first one is to fear the Lord. There in verse 14, he says, therefore, Fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Fear the Lord. Now, that's a, a strange thing to think about. We talk about fearing the Lord. And, and so I wanted to, to make sure we can give some emphasis there, give some explanation to that, because we're not talking about being in fear of God. We're talking about a reverence, not a terror. We're, we're, God doesn't want us to live afraid of him. That's not the fear he wants us to have. He wants us to have a reverential fear for him, a respect, an admiration, a trust, a commitment to him. When, when Joshua said, therefore, fear the Lord, he, he wasn't talking about us living scared to death of him because he understood that God had loved them, God had called them, God had chosen them, and we need to grasp that. Hopefully we have. Earlier this year, we spent a great deal of time understanding and studying how God loved us and wants us to have the assurance of our salvation as we went through 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Because there in 1st John 4, 18, we find there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. If perfect love drives out fear, then the perfect love of God cannot in the same time call us to live in fear, but to have a reference, to have a respect. Now, my parents are here today, and, and it's, it's very rare in the past that we've been able to be in, in church together for worship services. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, I don't remember when it came up in a message or exactly how it came up, but... Uh, they're moving to DeRitter, so this is going to happen a lot more often. Uh, and now the, the roles are going to be reversed. Instead of me ending up in his sermons, he's going to end up in mine. Uh, so, no. Uh, but growing up, I, I'm, just, I'm going to be honest with you, I had a reverential fear of my parents. And, and it wasn't that I was scared of them. It wasn't that I had a fear of, of my dad. It wasn't that he was an angry man. It wasn't that he was an abusive man. But I, have a, I had a reverence for him. And for me, it's easy to understand this idea of fear the Lord in the way he says it because I had that kind of fear towards my dad. I knew that he loved me. I, I knew that he wanted the best for me. But I also knew that if I went against the rules, if I did something wrong, I was going to be disciplined. You know, my parents were not scared to, to use the uh, um, leather influencer. It worked wonders, in, in my opinion. You know, they may have questioned it from time to time, but you know, hopefully the end result was, was pleasing. Uh, 
But I understood that. And I can remember being with friends and then go, Jason, why don't you do this? No, man, I'll get in trouble when I get home. You scared of your dad? Yep. He ever hurt you? Not extensively, but enough that I learned I didn't want to do that again. God wants us to have that kind of fear of him. Not being afraid of him, but knowing the force that he has, knowing the punishment he could give, and yet understanding the love he gives instead. To have that reverence for him. I wonder if that's what motivated the psalmist to write Psalm 111, verse 10, where he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, if we all had that kind of fear of God, our life would look a lot different. If we made every decision in life, if we faced every temptation that came our way with a reverential, true fear of God, thinking, God loves me, but I know what he could do in discipline for me. But because he loves me, I want to respect him. Our lives would look different. But it's because we lose that fear from time to time. It's because we, we don't think about that side of God. I think for so long we have emphasized the love of God so much we have forgotten the fear of the Lord. We've forgotten that love has to be balanced with an understanding of also his judgment. His discipline and his worth of our obedience. Which brings us to the second thing uh, when we talk about fear. Fear is obedience. It's not just having reverence in respecting, because let's be honest, the greatest way to show respect to someone is to be obedient to the things that they ask you to do. I've often used the example in, in church of obedience. The difference in obedience is if you as a parent ask your child to do something and they and they go do it, well, yeah, they did what you asked, but it wasn't really very obedient. However, if you ask, would you take the trash out? Sure, Dad, I'd be glad to do that for you. Well, that makes you feel good. They just did something because they cared enough to listen to what you're saying. It was obedience out of respect, not obedience out of demand. God wants us to be obedient, not just, well, God, if I have to, you know, don't raise your hands, but have you ever woke up on a Sunday morning, looked at your alarm clock and went, oh, I got to go to church. Don't, no confessional here. It's probably happened once or twice. I'm sure it's happened. I hope it's happened more often with work and other things than church, but there's times we get that way. God wants us to be cheerful in our obedience to him. He, he wants us to have a, a proper fear that motivates us to be obedient. Think of, of what we see in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. It says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you except to fear the Lord your God by walking in all his ways, to love him and to worship the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul? What does he ask of you? To fear him by walking in his ways. How do we show we have a fear of the Lord? By walking in what he wants us to do. By living out his will in our life. It's an obedience out of respect. It's an obedience out of admiration. It's an obedience out of, God, with all that you've done for me, I want to live for you. See, God's love that he's already given to us, his mercy, his grace he's already given to us should be the only motivator that we need to be obedient to him. It shouldn't be, well, if I don't serve God, he's going to strike me dead. I don't know if that's an accurate way to think about it. Is it possible? Sure. I mean, we can go read in the Old Testament. We see it happen pretty often. Once or twice in the New Testament. Don't know that God does that too often. If that were the case, I'm sure there'd be a lot less Christians in the world because we mess up, we make mistakes. But should that be our motivation? Oh, I don't want God to get me, so I better do it. How about with all that he's done for me, the least I can do is be obedient. I, I want to obey our goal and our desire as believers and especially for us as fathers, men, should be to serve him. In obedience to do what he has asked us to do in response to all that he has done look at Hebrews 12 28 and 29 therefore since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken let us hold on to grace by it we may serve God acceptably 
with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. With all that we are receiving, with all that is awaiting us, let's hold on to the grace of God. The fact that God did not have to love us and yet chose to love us anyway. The fact that we were unlovable, but he loved us anyway. Let us hold on to that grace, and by that grace, we can serve him acceptably with reverence. See, serving acceptably is different from just serving. Serving is what you get at McDonald's. Ten minutes after you ordered it. You know, can you please pull to number one, and you watch numbers two and three fill up after you, and then you watch numbers two and three leave before you, and you finally get your food and you drive home and you realize they left on the onions and the mustard that you asked not to have, even though it's printed on the tag with it. See, that's, that's just serving. And then you go to another place, and the people are bringing you so many drinks, you can't drink them. And, and they're, they're doing everything that they can to make you feel welcome, to make you feel at home, to make sure you don't lack anything. They're waiting on you, hand and foot, and doing everything. And you get it, and like, man, this was such a great experience. That's serving acceptably. God doesn't want us to just serve because, well, it's time to go to church. Let's go to church. Oh, it's time to stand up and sing. Brother Johnny said it's time to stand. I'm going to stand. And it's a song, so I'm going to stand. And I'm going to move my mouth so you think I'm singing, Brother Johnny, but I really don't. By the way, sometimes we can tell. So, you know, do yourself a favor and just have fun with it anyway. You know, don't, don't hold back. We, we probably won't hear you, so it doesn't matter if you don't sound right. Just just jump in anyway. God doesn't say make a beautiful sound. He says make a joyful noise. So you squawk, quack, croak, whatever it sounds like, just let it out and let God be glorified in it. But why do we just do them? Why do we just do things and call it service to God rather than doing it acceptably to him? We need to fear the Lord. Secondly, he says we need to worship the Lord. And, and I know depending on what translation you have, it might say worship the Lord, may say serve the Lord. So I figured for this one, we'll, we'll look at both. Be, because there are two different ways that this word is translated and, and multiple different meanings when you get down into the root words of it and how it's being used. But let's just take these two. Let's start with worship. If, if the meaning is to worship the Lord, well, what is worship? Well, according to Nelson Bible Dictionary, worship is reverent devotion and allegiance pledged to God. It's also the rituals or ceremonies by which this reverence is expressed. Therefore, worship is not just a scheduled time on Sunday. Matter of fact, the scheduled time on Sunday should be the least worship that you have throughout the week. If the most that you worship God is in that little window of when you're inside this building surrounded by other believers you're really not worshiping, you're just, back up to what we just said, you, you're just kind of serving. You're just kind of doing your part. See, the worship that we experience together should be an overflow from the worship that we each have experienced all week long personally in our walk with the Lord. That's why there are some who walk in the door and they don't care what they sound like. They're going to sing out with all that they are. They don't care if somebody hears them praying. They don't care if somebody hears them shout out an amen or praise the Lord or any of that because they've been walking with the Lord. They've been worshiping so much in their devotion. They've been showing that reverence on such a way that when they get here, they can't hold it in anymore. It's got to come out. And it's not to draw attention, and it's not to cause a scene. It's just an excitement that the Spirit of God has built up within them, and they want to express it in a way that honors Him. That's what worship should be. Not a Sunday morning, but a lifestyle we live day in and day out because of what God has done for us. That is worship. Now, when he talks here that we should worship the Lord, it's not merely an, an external worship. It's not just referring to, well, sing out to the Lord. Well, clap your hands for the Lord. We'll play a music for the Lord. We'll pray for the Lord. We'll study your word for the Lord. We'll tell others about him for the Lord. It's not just that outward expression. It's also the heart. And I would say more so the heart. When he says worship the Lord, because, if nothing else, for the fact that he says in sincerity and truth, we need to worship him with our heart. I think God is more worried about where our heart is than where our mouth is or our hands are. 
Because you can sing the loudest of anybody in the building and have the most beautiful voice, but if your heart isn't right, you're just making noise. You can have the perfect rhythm and clap. And listen, I'll be the first one to admit, if you see me clapping in a song and you realize he only clapped for a little while, it's because after a little while I have to choose either sing in key and in rhythm or clap in rhythm. The hands and the mouth can't both stay in rhythm at the same time. I, listen, I've tried for years. It just doesn't work. Eventually, one of them's going to get off. That's why I don't play music other than on a stereo or something along those lines. That's why I respect the people up here that can play an instrument and sing at the same time. I would say that it blows me away, but it makes me envious. I have to pray about that. It's very humbling. It's not about what we do. It's about why. Our worship, to truly worship the Lord, to give him the worship he desires, it's not about perfecting an art form or perfecting a practice. It's about having the right heart when we do it. How do we have the right heart to do it? Well, we have to have a repentant heart, a heart that understands, God, I need your forgiveness. God, I know I'm not perfect. God, I know I don't deserve to be able to come before you, but if you'll forgive me, God, I would love to give you my worship and my service. And we need to have a contrite heart. Say, we need to have a heart that is soft and moldable. God, teach me what you want me to do. God, show me where you want me to go. God, tell me what you want me to say. Rather than, hey, God, I figured out what I'm going to do for you. No, <laughs> you don't figure it out. I can't figure out what God wants, what, what I want to do for God. I have to listen and learn what he wants for me to do. That's how we make sure we have the right heart so that we can worship him. If that word truly means serve, if we want to look at that side, and I really think that it, it works both ways. I think we could take it either way, and it still honors the, the text as a whole, and it honors the message of what, what Joshua was trying to give. But if we, if we take it as serve, then it is our right and responsibility to serve the Lord. It's a right that we have because as his children, as those who have been saved by his grace, as those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, we have the right to now serve. And you say, well, I don't know that I've ever thought of being, you know, having the right to serve someone. Well, when it comes to serving God, it is a right. It's a privilege as much as it is also a responsibility. See, it's not just a choice of, well, I think I'm going to serve God. No, you either serve God or you live in rebellion towards God. There's really no option. If you were in Sunday school this morning, we, we covered Ephesians chapter 2, or at least the majority of it. There in verse 10, it tells us, you know, we love talking about verses 8 and 9. By grace you've been saved through faith. Woo! Lord, I didn't have to do anything to earn my salvation. I thank you as a free gift through Jesus Christ. I know I can't boast about it. I know I couldn't earn it, but you gave me the free gift. Woo! No works. And we forget to go to verse 10. Yeah. When it says, but... This new life that you have, this new salvation that's been given to you, the new creation that you are in Christ, you were created for good works. And not good works that you think about and not good works that you want to do, but for the good works that the Father has already prepared for you. See, if you're a believer today, God saved you not just so that you could have a place in heaven, which you do. He saved you not just so that you would have forgiveness of your past sins, which you do, but he saved you also because he has a purpose and a plan for your life that he wants you to fulfill. And you can. Not because you're the greatest and not because you come up with the best strategy, but if God has laid out a plan for you, God will also help you accomplish it. You just have to let him. You just have to be willing to take the first step and then God will start lighting the way for you and God will start giving you the understanding and the ability he wants us to be successful in doing what he's called us to do. He wants us to be able to live the life that he has called us to. He wants us to fulfill the works and the plans that he has for us. We just have to be willing. See, to serve him faithfully is more valued to him than, than a verbal commitment. To, to serve him faithfully is, is more valuable than to put on a good show. Let me, let me ask you this. Parents, how many of you, how many of you would love to, the minute you say, son or daughter, would you go do, would love to hear your kids say, yes, sir, I'll go do it. Yes, ma'am, I'll go do it. That would be great. But what if they never got up to go do it? Dad, I'll be glad to take the trash out for you. And Ten minutes later, you walk by and the trash is still sitting there. 20 minutes later, the trash is still sitting there. 
And the next day as you hear the truck drive by, you look over and the trash is still sitting there. Good lip service. I'll be glad to serve you. No commitment. 1 Samuel 15, 22. To obey is better than sacrifice. We see this time and time again throughout Scripture where God says, I'd rather you be obedient to me than show up to worship me. I'd rather you do what I've asked you to do than come and pledge to do it. I'd rather you actually fulfill the commitment that you've already made rather than to come and ask me to do more for you and to come and to tell me how good I am and how wonderful I am, but you're not showing me in service. To be obedient is better than sacrifice. Listen, y'all know my heart. By now you know my heart. If not, then we're never going to know each other. <laughs> worship is something I love. Worship, our time when we worship together, I enjoy it from the time it starts to the time it ends. I look forward to it. I wake up every Sunday morning excited about coming and worshiping with you. But if our worship never leads us to serve, it's wasted. Because God doesn't want us to tell him day in and day out, week after week, how good he is if we never let his goodness change who we are and change the life that we live. In the same way, parents, if your kids got up every day and told you how wonderful you were and how great you are, and every day they thanked you for everything that you do for them, and they were as polite as can be, but never once lifted a finger in the house, never once did a single thing to help you, and when you asked them to do things, I don't think I'm quite fit for that. I don't know if that's going to fit my timeline. I don't know that that fits my plans for today. You know, I'm just I'm a little bit nervous. I need some more time. If our kids ever gave that excuse to us, there, there, there'd be a very interesting conversation that would begin. Am I right? I mean, there's not a one of us that would let our kid look at us and go, you know, Dad, mm, just not feeling it today. <laughs> oh, really? Let me, let me help you feel something real quick. <laughs> but isn't that what we do to God so often? God, that's just, God, I'm not gifted for that. So the creation is going to tell the creator, I'm not made to accomplish what you built me for. Isn't that a strange turn of events? We need to serve. We need to worship him. We need to surrender to him. And the last part of it, he says, is it's in sincerity and truth. It's not the action itself that God wants. It's the true commitment. It's the reality of God. I'm doing this because I'm committed. I'm doing this because I love you. I'm doing this because I want to thank you for what you've done. He wants our service and he wants our worship to be real. Not, not just an outward expression, not just something that we do, but to be motivated by a heart that is truly committed. Because if it doesn't start in the heart, then it doesn't matter how it ends up in the hands. God's not worried about what our hands simply do. He's worried about where it originates from the heart. Is it for him? Is it because of him? Is it in honor of him? Or is it just because, well, God, this, this fits what I want. Action does not equate service. When we obey what God wants, that is our service to him. Not when we do what we think God wants. We need to be careful. We need to be committed. Thirdly, what does Joshua say we need to do? Fear the Lord, worship him in sincerity and truth, and get rid of the gods your fathers worshipped. We've got to remove the obstacles. We've got to get the things out of the way that, that stop us. He says, the gods are your fathers. That's where he starts. Get, get rid of the gods of your fathers. Get rid of the things that, that trip them up. See, the, the gods of the Egyptians from their time of captivity, they had taken on some of the worship styles of the Egyptians. They had begun uh, living that out. Think of it, they, they, many of them grew up in captivity. They, they grew up in homes of Egyptian slave masters. And the, the Egyptians worshipped these gods. And maybe they saw something come from it. And they thought, well, you know, if they worship, it works for us. But then God revealed himself to them. God delivered them, and through Moses, God taught them who he was. And so now Joshua is saying, listen, you need to get rid of all those things you've been hanging on to. The gods that your fathers worshipped back on the other side of the Euphrates, when they were in bondage, when they were in slavery, get rid of those things. Get rid of the gods of, of this land. 
See, again, as they were going through, as they were conquering, some would come across, they'd conquer a land, they'd see an idol, they'd see and hear about a false god that's there, and it began to creep in the idolatry of worshiping false gods. And Joshua said, get rid of it. Get rid of all of it that is not God. Get rid of these obstacles. Get rid of these things. It was time to get rid of the false gods and be fully committed to the one true God. That's where he was headed. The, the way that you fear God, the way that you worship and serve him is first, get rid of everything that's not of him. Get rid of the obstacles. And when I was thinking through that, I was, I was praying through that, and the Lord just kept hitting me with, well, what are your gods? I'm not talking about the gods of your fathers. I'm not talking about the, the, the things of another land that you've allowed. What are the things that we struggle with? What are the things that you struggle with, that I struggle with? What are the things that we have allowed to become gods in our own life? Things that have taken the place of God. Things that have become more important. You say, oh, nothing's more important than God. Does our life really show that? What do we give the most attention to? What do we spend the most time with? Is God really the most important thing in our life? Or are there other things that have taken his place? Because if there are other things that they get more credit, that get more uh, time from us, they get more commitment from us, we have false gods in our life. That we need to, number one, acknowledge. Because until you acknowledge it, you can't do anything about it. But once we acknowledge it, then we need to repent of it and let God remove it. And it's not just a, God, I don't want this anymore. It's actually making an effort that it's not there anymore. In the same way that a person that wants to quit a habit like smoking or drinking, you don't quit a habit by going and stocking up on what the problem is. Well, I'm going to quit smoking, but I'm going to keep these here just in case. Well, you want to quit smoking, you get rid of cigarettes. You want to quit chewing tobacco, you get rid of your dip, your, your chewing tobacco, whatever it is. You want to quit drinking, you get rid of all the alcohol. You, you want to quit putting things in the place of God, get rid of everything that's in the place of God. Set them where they're supposed to be. So, well, not everything in our life is, is bad, Brother Jason. I, I get that. But here's the thing. Sometimes we take, we take things that are special and we take things that are supposed to be dear to us and we put them in the wrong priority and we let them take precedent over God, like family. Some people, their family is the greatest God in their life. You know how you know it? Because they'll never say anything to their family because they're scared they're going to offend their family. So rather than be obedient to God, they're going to, commit to family forgetting in that moment that by not being a witness to family they're endangering their family of an eternal separation from God you also see it because we'd rather spend time with family than than be at church we'd rather go do with family than go do this and we've got to be careful because anything that we put as more important than God in our life God's going to find a way to become number one Especially if we are his children. We need to make sure we're not putting those things that are dear to us as things that, that we've put up there, that, that, that we've said, I'm going to give more attention to this. But see, it's not just that kind of thing. It's also us hanging on to the things we know we're supposed to have let go of already. Well, I don't do it as much as I used to. Yeah, but if it's still around, it's still around. It's still a problem. It's still an obstacle that's in the way. We cannot effectively serve the Lord, and fathers, we cannot effectively lead our families if we're saying and doing one thing on Sunday but something different on Monday through Saturday because they're going to see the difference. You may be able to fool everybody in the church house, but you won't fool anybody in your house because they see it. They know it. They know the reality Whereas the reality should be, we should be living different. Because as Paul talked about in Ephesians 4, verses 17 and, and jumping down to 22, you should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts, because you took off the former way of life, the old man that is corrupted by deceitful desires. There should be a different lifestyle. We shouldn't walk the same way we used to walk. We shouldn't talk the same way we used to talk. There should be a difference, a noticeable difference in our home and to anyone who knows us. And maybe it's not so much letting go of things in our past, but more getting rid of the little things that have become a part of our daily life that we've just dismissed as 
our little issues. That's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's the polite word. The reality is it's sin. I had a, a professor at New Orleans that's now the uh, uh, director of the Louisiana Baptist Children's Home We'd get into these conversations and, and he'd start talking about something like gossip and, and he'd be going on. He goes, you, you know what, and, and describing, you know what, you know what that's called, right? You know what that's called? And we're like, gossip? He goes, no. You know, talking about people? No. Lying? No. He goes, sin. It's called sin. We need to quit labeling things as the excuses we use and just call sin, sin. See, you and I don't have little issues. We, we don't have little flaws. We have sin. Sin's not a pretty word. It's not a fun word. We don't like talking about sin. But the reality is until we acknowledge it as sin, there is no deliverance from it. And there's no forgiveness for it. Because if we excuse it, then we're not repenting of it. We're trying to hide it. And sometimes we don't even try to hide it. We just, we, well, you know, that's just the way our family is. Well, it's time for a family change. Because if you have a new life, that means you have a new family. And the new family that you've been reborn into, I promise you, if it's a sin, your family wasn't made that way. It's not who you are anymore. It shouldn't be. These are the things that I think the, the author of Hebrews was talking about in Hebrews 12.1, where he says, Therefore, since we have such a large crowd of, uh, cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that lies before us. Lay aside the weight. Lay aside the sins, lay aside the burdens, lay aside the guilt, lay aside those things that we've surrendered to Christ and get rid of the sin that so easily entangles us. That little thing that we excuse all the time, that little thing that we try to overlook, that little thing, and by the way, we think it's a little thing, it's really not. Because you can't, you can't categorize sin as little sins, big sins. You don't have your once a week sins and your you know, once a day sins. You have sin. Little sin, big sin, sin is sin. And we need to deal with it. Because it will, not it might, it will hinder your service to the Lord. And it will hinder fathers the way you can lead your family. You cannot lead effectively as a godly father if you willingly allow sin to reside in your life. It has to be acknowledged, it has to be repented of, and it has to be left at the foot of the cross. Let forgiveness come. Now, as we close the message, Joshua then makes one more thing. He says, here's, here's what you need to do. You need to fear the Lord. You need to worship him in sincerity and truth. And you need to get rid of the gods of your fathers. And he gets down to the end and he says, but if that is not acceptable for you, choose. You choose for you. I've, I've told you. I mean, you can, you can see it. You can hear it in Joshua's voice. I've told you everything I could tell you. I've led you as far as I can lead you. Now you have to choose for yourself. And you know what? The same is true now for each one of us. Men, fathers, ladies, teenagers, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are, you have to choose for you if you're going to live up to the standard that God's called us to. You see, it doesn't matter who stands in this pulpit and tells you whatever they tell you. It doesn't matter how many videos you watch online. It doesn't matter how many songs you listen to. It doesn't matter how many podcasts or vlogs you read. It doesn't matter any of that. If you never make a choice on who you're going to serve, your life will never change. And you'll never be the man or the woman of God that he's created you to be. But the day that you choose for yourself, I'm going to be the man God wants me to be. I'm going to be the woman God wants me to be. The day you make that choice and that commitment, then God can do something in your life and he can do something through your life. And if you're a father and you make that commitment, you have the opportunity to make the same commitment that Joshua made. Listen, the rest of you can choose for yourself what you're going to do, but as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to be committed to him. See, that it has to start with you. You need to be the one to set your feet firmly, in, not in the sand, not in the ground, but firmly in the word of God and say, I choose for me and for my family that follows me. I choose to serve and to honor the Lord. And then let God work. See, Joshua chose to lead his family. Joshua chose to call the others to lead their families. 
if, if this wasn't an important thing, it probably would not have been his last challenge to the people. But he understood how important it would be. He, God had revealed to him in some way that this was going to be an obstacle that they faced. And listen, they faced it over and over and over. Regardless of who was in leadership, the nation continued to struggle with idolatry. Worshiping the other idols and the other gods. But Joshua said, listen, I'm not saying as a nation, let's do this. I'm saying you choose for you and for your family who you will serve. But as for me, I serve my family. We serve the Lord. Joshua made a choice. What about you, fathers? Today you get to choose. You say, well, I've already chose. Great. But every day we have to choose. Because when you wake up tomorrow, you have a choice. Who are you going to serve that day? Who are you going to serve tomorrow? Your own will, your own plan, your, your boss, your family, or are you going to serve the Lord? See, you can still be a model employee, but be a strong follower of Christ at the same time. And if ever that becomes an issue, I can promise you the fault doesn't rely with being faithful to God. Maybe that's when it's time to find a better job the job that God wants for you. But men, we have to choose. And so here's what I, but before we even get to the actual invitation, here's, here's what I want us to do. Men, if you're willing to make that choice, if you're willing to say, I, I choose for me and for my family to serve the Lord. I choose to fear him. I choose to serve him, to worship him. I choose to get rid of every obstacle that would hinder me from being able to be the man he wants me to be. If you're willing to make that choice, I'm going to ask you to do something. It's not going to be fun. It's probably going to be very awkward for some of you, but I'm going to ask you to do it nonetheless. Because it took a lot of guts for Joshua to stand in front of the assembly and to make that challenge. It's to, it, it took a lot of guts for each of those men to then, in their families, make a choice. So I'm going to ask you to make a choice today. And I'm going to ask you where you are. You don't have to walk up to the front or anything like that. I'm just going to ask you, men, if you're ready to make that kind of commitment to say, God, I want to be the godly father that you have called me to be, I'm going to ask you to stand. You can just stand right where you are. Don't stand because somebody else stands. Don't stand just because the preacher's telling you to stand. If you're ready to make that kind of commitment, then you stand. Because I want to be able to pray for you today. I want to be able to pray with us. That, that God would work in us to give us the ability to live out the commitment we're choosing to make today. Because I'm going to be honest with you, it's not going to be easy. It doesn't matter if you still have little bitty kids at home that don't take much to, to do right and to point them in the right direction. Or if all your kids are so old, they're out raising their own kids and possibly their own grandkids. It doesn't change. The commitment that it takes from day one is the same commitment that it takes the last day that you're the father. Because even if you have three generations following you, they're still following you. I want to pray for these men, and then we're going to open our invitation and let God do what he needs to do today in this place. But let, let's pray for our, our fathers this morning. Heavenly Father, I just want to come before you, and I, God, I, I thank you for these men that, that willingly, openly, and boldly took a stand today. And God, I pray that it wouldn't just simply be a reaction to a call, but God, that for each one of us, as we determine in our hearts we want to stand for you, God, that we would actually stand. Whether that be physical, whether that be metaphorical, God, I pray that we would stand for you in whatever sense you call us to. God, that we would fear you, we would honor you, we would serve you, we would worship you, and we would allow you to remove any and every obstacle out of our way that we could be faithful in the commitment that we make today. So Lord, have your way in our heart, not just today, but every day so that we can be the men that you need us to be, to lead our families, not just to lead well, but God, to lead the way you would have us to lead. And I thank you. God, I thank you that you're going to use the commitments made today, not only to change families now, but to shape them for future generations. We love you and we thank you, God. We ask this all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask everyone, if you would, to join us now in standing and ask our praise team to go ahead and come forward. We're going to have a time of, of worship. We're going to, our team's going to come and lead us in a song of worship this morning for our invitation. And Maybe you're here today and there's a commitment that you need to make. Uh, maybe 
Maybe you need to get some things right with the Lord. Maybe you're one of the dads that just took a stand and realized, you know what, God, I already see there's things that I need you to deal with. This is your opportunity. This is your chance. You can pray where you are. You can come pray here at the altar. You can come pray with me. Maybe you're here today and, and you realize that you need salvation. There's no better time than right now. Maybe there's someone in this place that you realized over the, the last week, maybe it happened today, maybe it happened weeks ago and you've been putting it off, but there's somebody here that you know you need to go to and you need to offer forgiveness or you need to ask forgiveness. Listen, I, I don't know what it is God might be leading you to do in this moment, but I know this, this is the one opportunity that we know for sure that we have. Maybe you've been looking for family and maybe God's leading you to be part of our family here. You can come, and today you can join our family. So whatever it is, whatever God is burdening your heart for, this is your chance. This is your opportunity. As we sing, would you come? Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down. for the weary rest that endures earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure earth has no sorrow that heaven can't cure so lay down your burdens lay down your shame
What a great day. Uh, glad that you're here with us. A couple things real quick and then some news to share with you. Um, ooh, that, I have a feeling that was me. Um, I'm going to get behind the speakers that are catching. Uh, next Sunday, we start Vacation Bible School. Next Sunday night. So, number one, teachers, don't panic, but it's here. Uh, so this week is the opportunity for you to come and start setting up your class, get some decorations done. Uh, you know, normally by Thursday, we've got the building open, we've got the air on, you can come in, do what you need to do Thursday, Friday, Saturday. If you need to come earlier in the week, if you need to come in the evening, just let me know when you need to come. We'll make sure we can get the building open for you and, and uh, get it locked up when you're done. Uh, but you need to know that can, that, this is the week to get that done. If you need to wait till the weekend, that's fine, but you do have opportunity to do that throughout the week. The one thing we do ask is the rooms that we're currently using for Sunday school, if you could leave the tables and chairs in for next Sunday morning, and then we can get them out that afternoon. Uh, but I know that just makes it a little bit easier on the teachers when everybody's in there to have that space to be able to, uh, to do that. Even if you have to move it out the way or put the tables, the chairs on top of the tables while you decorate and get things set up, you can have the room fully decorated just if, if we can leave enough tables and chairs in the classrooms for them to use. Uh, that way we can still have Sunday school functional next week. Uh, if you ordered things to decorate your room, special things that you ordered from either Lifeway or Oriental Trading, they are here. I have them on the, the serving counter in the fellowship hall. Your name is on your pile of things, uh, except for one. So I'll, uh, if you need to go get it and you walk through and you don't see yours, let me know. I'll come show you which one is. I, I have the, the list back there with it. Uh, but we do have that. And uh, 
we will have by, by next Sunday, we'll have your name tags. We've got the Bibles. We just need to put them in the classrooms for you. Uh, all of that will be available uh, before Bible school starts next Sunday night. Uh, again, be praying for our Bible school. Be praying for our teachers. Uh, they're listed there on our, our uh, announcement flyer. Be praying for all the kids that are going to be here throughout the week. And uh, if you are just, I, I, know, I know how you feel. You hadn't signed up for Bible school, but you're just itching. I mean, you just, you can't help it. You just have to be here next week. We still have a few places where we could use some help. Uh, we, we could use some help in the kitchen with Ms. Glenda, getting some things uh, set up and picked up. We can use some help uh, in here with the music rotation. We need somebody to start and stop CDs for the people that are doing the, or videos. I forget which one we use. I think it's videos uh, to get that done for them. Uh, we need somebody to walk around and take pictures all night. So look, you don't even have to teach anything. You just walk around with a camera or a phone and you take pictures of kids and make them smile uh, and then get the pictures to us so we can do a slideshow at the end of the week. We've got all kinds of things that we can use you for. We just need you to let us know that you can be here. Uh, so if you'll do that, if you'll let me know if you can help out in any of those, uh, we'd be glad to point you in the right direction of, of where we can use you for that. Um, uh, and I was trying to think there was one other thing, but I don't think it's VBS. Oh, youth camp. Youth camp is coming up the very next week. So we've got this week to decorate. The week after is VBS. The following week is youth camp. Uh, for all of our youth that are going, parents, remember next Sunday is the time to get the final payments in. Uh, if you're unsure of how much you've paid or how much you owe, get with me. I have a list. I can, I can fill you in on the details on that. Uh, but we need to get that in by next Sunday so that we can make sure we pay the camp. Uh, otherwise, we'll get there and they'll tell us we've got to send kids home. Uh, and we don't want to have to do that. But uh, we're looking forward to it. It's going to be a great time. That's the only announcement, announcements I had other than watch your... Actually, no, there's one more. Uh, be looking in the flyer. There's things on the front and the back, a lot of stuff that's coming up. Our summer is, is starting to get pretty busy. Uh, there is one thing on the top of the back side of the flyer, a prayer emphasis that our association is, is promoting. Um, we're calling on every believer throughout our association and actually across Southwest Louisiana to commit to pray for the kids as they go into any opportunity where the gospel is going to be presented at Dry Creek Camp this summer. Uh, Dry Creek is a camp that we as an association sponsor. Many of you have probably been out there for different things. Maybe you grew up going to camp there as a kid and a teenager. Uh, but we are, are challenging all Christians to pray for them. And the easiest way that you can do that, if you notice, there's a, an 800 number on that, in that announcement that you can send the word pray to that number, and you're going to sign up for a special uh, reminder Every day when there's camp, so it'll only be like Monday through Thursday, Monday through Friday for the next four weeks, once or maybe twice a day at most, you'll get a text that simply says, pray for students at Dry Creek. When you get that text, stop what you're doing, say a prayer that God would speak to the kids uh, while they're there, and you'll get that notification throughout the four weeks. Once camp is over at Dry Creek, the system that's been created shuts down, so you'll get no other messages. You're not signing up for a service. You're simply signing up to get those reminders. Uh, your number will be safe. I promise that. It won't cost you anything unless you get charged for text messages. Uh, you can also, if, if you're uh, a little more um, uh, digitally uh, able, you can take a picture of the little QR code that's there with it, and it'll connect you to it where you can sign up there as well. So either way, you don't have to tell me, you don't have to make a promise to me. If you feel led to do that, sign up for it and uh, join us as we start praying this week. Uh, this is the first week of, of, of camp, of Dry Creek's camps this week. Uh, is GA camp. Uh, Y'all be praying not only for the students that are there, but be praying for Jasmine. Uh, she is the, uh, the lead speaker for the week. Uh, so she'll be speaking every evening uh, and helping out with some of the Bible studies during the day. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful week for the girls, but uh, just, just pray that God would do a special move out there, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll celebrate what comes from it. Uh, now, last thing, and then we're going to close in prayer. Mom, Dad, y'all y'all come. And Keith, I'm going to step back to the front because I'm not going to do this from up there. So maybe pull me down just a hair. I've mentioned a couple of times lately that my parents are moving to DeRitter. Uh, they're buying a house out on Harmony Trail, and they're excited about moving here. Uh, probably never would have dreamed when, when we moved out of Eunice back in February of 98 
that eventually we would live in the same town again in Deritter. No offense, but growing up in Eunice, playing basketball at Eunice High School, Deritter was the last place I ever thought I would end up. But here we are. Uh, and being that they're moving to Deritter, they said, well, we know where we're going to make our church family. And so they come today uh, seeking to join by promise of letter from Trinity in Pineville. And uh, we're excited about it. They're excited about it. Church, what do you say? Yeah. Mm. So most of y'all already know my parents from different things that they've been able to come and do, whether revivals or singings or just come and visit. But I'm going to ask you to come by and, and uh, just welcome them and uh, let them know how excited you are to have them in the community. And then I want you to go home and enjoy having a great day for Father's Day uh, with the, the special men in your life. And if you can't go and spend time with your father, at least give them a call. Let them know you love them. Let them know you were thinking about them today. And uh, let's make it a special day. But uh, let's close in a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. And I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week this week. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you. And we thank you, God, and... and God, for myself, and I believe I can speak for everyone here, we can say it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. Now, Father, as we leave from this place, watch over us, keep us safe. And God, I pray again, God, that today we would make sure that the fathers in our lives know how loved they are, how appreciated they are. But God, even more, I pray that we would make a special effort to let you as our Heavenly Father know how much we love you. And be willing to commit ourselves to you to show the appreciation and the love that we have. We love you. We thank you. God, just give us the strength and the wisdom to live the life you want us to live this week. For we ask this in the precious and the holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.